Uh, I know you're not here to see me, so ladies and gentlemen, the creator of House of Lies, Matthew Carnahan. <laughs> and the star of House of Lies and his other executive producer, Mr. Don Cheadle. Um, one of the things I was saying to, to Matthew backstage, Don, is that the show, especially in the last, the last season, and it feels like this way too, it feels like it's structured like a three-act play, like it's broken down that way. And I was wondering if you guys, how conscious that is, and if that's something you work at, or if it's just something that's happened over the course of the, the show. Um, well, I mean, it's really under this man's sort of helmage, and that's not a word. Um, but he, he's, you know, obviously the brainchild behind, uh, behind this and, and uh, what's great about it is I get to come in and, uh, just sort of be downloaded, although I'm a part of the process. They make me feel like I actually a part of the process, but there's, it's so, it's such an excellent room and there's so, uh, many, uh, strong ideas and a strong identity about what the show is that I think it, it works very well. And, and I don't know if that was a plan, that it was structured that way, because I never thought about it in that way. But I, kn I know what you mean, though. It feels like these characters really have arcs that make sense and beginnings and middles and, and resolutions that make sense. What's fun for me is at the end of every season, I'm like, how are we, how are we possibly going to get out of that? I have no idea how we're going to get back. And that's always fun, you know. And uh, the other thing, too, and I mentioned this to you backstage, Matthew, is that each of the seasons that end with a kind of a, a farce detonation that reminds me of Fado. I mean, it's a really sort of that, that the wedding fight at the end of the second season and that big sort of party that ends up with you being by yourself finally, you know, screaming at the world at the end of the first season. That's something you really work at, isn't it? Yeah, I, I'm a, I, I love farce. I love Fado especially. Um, and we don't, it's the, the show is generally not farcical. Um, but we usually try to build to some sort of, um, uh, justified chaos and, you know, absolute entropy and, and, uh, you know, and, and so, you know, the second end of the second season was sort of, you know, a flea in her ear and, um, uh, the, uh, the, this season um, don't tell him. Is uh, you don't want him to tell you how the season ends. <laughs> they're not going to tell anybody. Come on, now they're cool. Don Cheadle drowns. I drown. In a vat of champagne. Yes. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> it's Sunset Boulevard is a much is a much quieter uh, 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 kind of existential, I guess, uh, ending. But um, but yeah, the first two seasons have been big, slamming doors and literally you know wedding cake in the face and you know things that are um you know uh uh farcical yeah uh, which is fun i enjoy that well let's see, just watching the shows get ready for this um what i was noticing is really fascinating watching you play down a guy who gets lonelier and lonelier with each episode i mean he is probably the most self-destructive character you've ever played and given that you know he has a plan he doesn't know what to do once he walks outside of the business world and I just wonder how you found a way to sort of just have this loneliness get kind of incrementally worse over every episode. I just draw from my life. <laughs> I just bring all that work in. Um, Is that your family leaving? Right? <laughs> yeah, that's, see you, baby. Yeah. Oh, no, he hasn't seen them in years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It keeps me sharp. Um, no, uh, it's, it's, it, is, it is interesting to see how much further away from himself his this character can get and how scared he always just seems like he's really scared to me he just seems like it's he's the most frightened character that i think that i've ever played with the most bravado yeah. <laughs> you know it, it's it's proportional too you know the more i don't give a shit the more terrified he is i think and that's kind of the fuel that he uses i think you know and this is all character shit that may not even but it, you know, very early in the in the the season, first episode, in fact, we talk about his his mother's suicide, and that just became a real engine for my character. I felt like right away this 
this person who's just terrified to let anybody get close because people who get close to you fuck you over and they leave and they kill themselves and you have to deal with the tragedy and that's or he picks the worst possible partners so absolutely to confirm it to yeah. con con confirm it but it's the confirmation of it also is the engine that allows him i think to go out there and just be a monster in the business world you know because he's like i'm gonna get you before you get me and everyone does it and i don't have to feel responsible for it and he's found a perfect place to use that sort of nihilistic attitude to, to succeed, and he's very successful in that. But exactly as you say, as soon as he walks out of that, he has no idea what to do with his son. He can't keep a relationship. His father is, you know, always knows more than he does, and he's a child in, in many ways. Well, talk about writing that character too, Matthew, because I just found just, it's fascinating because the point where I thought he's going to become a man near the last third of the second season after he forces the police and any black man in Los Angeles should know better than to yeah. mouth off to the LAPD. He yeah. <laughs> when he does, I'm thinking, okay, this is a guy who's trying to kill himself. And just talk about the construction of that that section of the season a little bit. Um, well, that that was a uh, an episode where um, where Marty um, sold out not only himself but basically his race. Um, he, he, he sort of got behind, uh, um, a, a bank and a, and a, a, a guy with political aspirations who, uh, you know, who had, who had, uh, what are they called? What are Orchestra, the sub, subprime that, you know, those, uh, ghetto Prime loans. Mortgages. Ghetto yeah. loans. Yeah. Yeah. Um, th there's a, th you know, that practice of redlining, uh, you know, giving loans to minorities, but giving them at a at an impossible um, rate, and uh, he, you know, Marty sells himself out and kind of has a breakdown, and and his in his tortured mind decides that the way he's going to uh, do his penance is to get his ass completely kicked by the LAPD. Um, we call that VIP treatment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> yes, I've been in that lounge before myself. That's yeah. what Edi Amin called it too. Is to <laughs> give him VIP treatment. <laughs> so um, yeah, I mean, it was a very uh, painful episode, you know, and funny, um, you know, and uh, uh, you know, I think it was challenging to 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 do as well um it felt like almost something that had to come after the this kind of the atmosphere in this country and then and, and trayvon because i remember you guys came to do the show you were in the hoodie yeah that was actually i was going to say to matthew that was interesting because that's the first thing he said to me that day that we came to see you uh way back before the season started he's like yeah. i want to do something around this about yeah. this I, I don't want marty i want marty not to to be immune to this as well even though it seems like it's miles away from anything he would ever have to deal with and it just kind of found its way into that expression i think yeah yeah that was that was really interesting i mean i remember that day so clearly because it was uh, i don't know it was maybe a few di four days after this after the trayvon thing happened and i was completely uh freaked out I remember walking up to Don and meet before we met at your studio and, and just going, w w what do I do? I just felt like such an idiot because I, I don't know, I feel like some passive participant in, you know, in a world that, where that can happen, you know, and, uh, and so we just started talking about it that day. It was really interesting. But I just it, thought too, the way you way. played it, Don, me, it, it all ends up to, Rather to me, led up to that last scene where your reflection is talking to you, and I thought that's some of the best work you've ever done. Just of watching that is the first time we got a chance to see what Marty thinks of himself, right. but it's not spelled out in a way. I mean, I just thought it was a, first of all a great piece of writing, but also a really tough scene to play, and you played it so beautifully. I mean, and really, I, I've got to give it up to Stephen Hopkins, who's you know who directed that episode, and also the the episode you're talking about with the uh, getting beat up under the the overpass and he's as you can tell if you watch the season and just watch his episodes he's really bold and pushes things and wants to go way out on the ledge and and 
I think it makes our show so dynamic and, and really interesting and exciting that you never know, we never know, you know, we, we kind of never know what's going to happen. I think that there's a feeling of that when you watch it, like, I don't know what's, what these guys are going to do next. And I think his, his guidance in those, in those moments is really invaluable. And that was, you know, their brainchild in the writing room, but his idea of how to capture it and kind of the things that we were saying that my reflection would say to me. And it is, it's the only time you really hear Marty, the time that Marty tells the truth is when he's looking right at the, you know, the people. He's looking at himself and being honest. That's the only time you really get to see it. And with the son, I think he's, I think he's honest with Roscoe. I think he wants to be honest with Roscoe, but he doesn't know how to talk to him. And with each... And he honestly doesn't know how to talk to him. I mean, like, one of my favorite lines is early, I think it's in the first season, no, it's in the second season, and Roscoe comes up to Marty and says, what, Dad, what do you do if you like a boy and a girl? Yeah. And in his perfect Marty wisdom, he says, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I was like, <laughs> I love that. It's like, I, I don't know. But don't, but don't forget, there's like a two-second pause. Because oh, yeah. You can see, like, all the lights. Everything no he said. Don't. Um, be straight, uh, be fully gay, uh, be straight and gay. Uh, I don't fucking know. I have to go to work. <laughs> that's, that's what he knew. I've got to go to work right now. Well, I guess that's something interesting too because what I loved is this thing that came out in the second season is how much everybody loves his son, how much everybody loves Roscoe. And you almost wonder if, and I wonder if this comes for you in the, the writing, Matthew, if at some point for you, Marty was that guy who was, as, they, as, as, as everybody says, who was so open and loving and accepting and eager. Do you think Marty was that guy at some point? I mean, both questions. I, I, I do. I mean, I do. At the, what is that saying about cynics? The greatest cynics were the most optimistic. You know, it's yes, like, yeah, there's Balzac, yeah. I mean, yeah. But it's hard, inside the, every cynic beats the heart of a true romantic. True romantic, that, that, yeah. That's exactly that's what, what I, he was. Exactly what I thought about with... Uh, with with Marty and and Roscoe and that he was that kid and and uh, you know um, you actually put it in Glenn's mouth Glenn Glenn Turman my who plays my father on the show says it in one episode he goes you used to be open and yeah. loving and yeah yeah and then Kristen says the exact same thing about him the next episode I mean so it's an interesting sort of thing to see this and it seems to me in this character part of his fear is that he's afraid he's going to turn his son into himself. I mean, that seems to be a real fear. And so many, of the, so many of the scenes that you get so physically frustrated, like you, yeah. your shoulders tighten and you don't know what to do with your hands yeah. with him, but you, it seems like you want to reach out and touch him, but you're afraid to make him into you, but you also don't know how to touch this kid who's figuring out his sexuality. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think Marty's a ball of I don't know what to do. Yeah. Unless there's a, you know, a PowerPoint or a deck or somebody to murder on the other end of a business deal. It's like, then I got it. But how to talk to my son about a girl that he likes or a boy that he likes or both that he likes. It's like, yeah, I don't want to damage you. And the best way to do it is to start trying to counsel you <laughs> other than just, you know, uh, yeah, he does. He, and he loves it. I also love on the show that he loves it when Roscoe acts out, you know, yeah. Marty loves it when Roscoe, you know, does that to everybody. He's like, yes, <laughs> that's my boy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, talk about finding Adonis who's Leonard, who's such a terrific actor, and I think is probably one of the real great underrecognized talents on television. He's really, and just to see how much, I'm just telling you backstage, how much more conf confident he is now physically, now that he's older. I mean, he's almost like, I was telling you, he looks like the dad of the boy from the first season. Almost. Yeah, yeah he, he almost too confident. Um, <laughs> he's, no, he's incredible. He's just incredible. I mean, I remember when he came in to audition, he... Uh, he was this little boy with a tutu and uh, combat boots and um, tights, I believe. Tights. Remember and, he asked uh, you if he, if he should wear panties too? Yeah, I was like, dude, I, you're doing great. <laughs> we won't see them anyway. <laughs> Don't even talk about it. Um, but he was so, uh, he had this ebullience, you know, he had this, you know, this thing, he was, he's just one of these kids who's lit up and, uh, and, uh, is a, a great little soul. And now he's a tall soul, but, um, he's remarkable. And, and we really just, we gave him the ball this year and let him run with it. And that, that was really fun. You know, it put him in a relationship where his, 
um, his gender issues for the first time become sexualized, become sexual issues as well, sexual identity issues as well, not just uh, gender identity issues. And and uh, and you know, uh, we hired uh, Bex Taylor Klaus to be his girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever she is. Um, and, and, uh, and that relationship, you know, tracks through the whole season and, and really gives him a tremendous amount to do. And he really, really, you know, he really answered the call. He's amazing and funny and, and, and heartbreaking. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I like so much about the show, Don, is that you've often played these characters who know to do themselves physically, who often use that kind of physicality as a way to express themselves. And Marty is the most repressed black man I've ever seen you play. <laughs> and I wonder if you base it on something, or is that something you kind of figured out over the course of this? Because you, you arrived at that pretty quickly. Um, again, just drawing from my life. Uh, <laughs> no, look, the character was, was there. It's, it's one of the reasons why I said yes so quickly is because, it yeah, it, it, it was always on the page. I mean, there's very little. We improv, and we things find their way there. And, and if something's really funny and it wins, Everyone behind the camera is like, do that. But it's there. It's, it's really the structure is there, and these characters are very clear, and, and, and their you know trajectories I mean? you, you are clear. You guys who move a lot, mm -hmm. like who are very expressive with their hands, and unless Marty's making a point with his hands, he almost his, his arms are his side. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 there's, there's keys for me. It's, like, it's always interesting coming back. Uh, when I've done something else and I've been off, and we, you know, we work three months on the show, so there's a lot of time when we're not on the show. And until the you know for the first couple of days I don't kn I don't know who he is in my body again. It takes a minute, and then I I move my head a certain way. And I'm like, oh okay, that's 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 who he is, and that's where he comes from. I don't want to analyze it because it'll fuck me up. But it feels like <laughs> it, you know I know that I wanted to I know that there's a a real thing about him moving a lot like I always think of a boxer like he's sticking and moving and he doesn't but he's really always, want to get anything really, caught not, on him he's, he's slipping more than ducking you know yeah, he's slipping no it's yeah. slipping it's not no not no he's you got to stay in there and you it's really hit hit. it's really only when he's in a business yeah. setting that he has that kind of uh you know we described it a lot early on as as kind of shark-like <laughs> movement you know he's very stealthy and he's very you know very fast and very and does things you know unpredictably and um you know he will blow up a, a business you know situation just for fun just to see if he can get it back again and you know so he has all of this swagger this major swag in in his uh in his business life and then you know and then you see him kind of you yeah. deflate in a in a very vulnerable way with his family you know he just kind of stands there and takes it you know from his father and his son well what i liked in the season two is that you have that scene in the episode with uh sally ann richardson where you actually see marty get hypnotized by another shark which is really kind of just wait a second what am i doing yeah, here? Right. well i bought that for a second <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i just it's it's i want to talk to you about a little bit about that too because it's almost like Marty's not in control anymore. He's so out of control that he can actually be taken by somebody he should be smarter than. Well, again, that's that sort of wish fulfillment I think that he has of like, oh, maybe there can be something that's, you know, maybe there'll be some connectivity here and we'll actually, we can be real with each other for a second. She's like, you bought that shit? It's like, no, I didn't, no, I knew you were, no, I didn't buy it. You know, it's like he's never going to, yet anyway, and I don't think we should allow him to do that for many seasons to come, David. Nevins, are you here? Um, but he's, you know, he's not going to get that brass ring. It's he's not going to get to, or if he does get that moment, it's going to be pulled away from him really quickly. And I think, you know, he's constantly fighting this sort of reaffirmation of how hollow everything is, you know. And any moment that, and we all know people like this that are like. Never going to take a shot, never going to take a shot, never going to take a shot, never going to take a shot. And they go, okay, I'm going to take a shot. And it's like, smack, smack. And they go, see? You know, it's like that's, I think that's the path that he's off and on. Like, I don't let anything happen to me. I don't let that window open because as soon as I do, I get smacked for it. And I think that's, as long as he's dealing with that and confronting that and 
always having to figure out a way to to you know to to write himself after that happens then he's he's an interesting unpredictable character because is he going to do it to himself or is somebody going to do it to him but it's going to get done to him but that's self-destruction as i was talking about you're alluding to it here each season is ended with him basically exploding everything around him and it's like you're saying matthew at some points you see it's almost like he's so smart he's so far ahead of everybody he has to sort of blow things up a little bit and just to sort of reorganize them but by the end of a season it's like i can't do this anymore i can't keep my life in control i have to blow things up and there's that off each each season is in it with a truly awful lonely moment for him and i wonder talk, walk us through a little bit of that where finally he just has to knock everything off the table and we don't know how the show's going to end up in the next season yeah that's i mean it it's interesting that each season we've completely decimated his his life uh, we've you know first season basically he, he, yeah uh you know his family is kind of taken away he loses his tie to his son who moves out and his father is disgusted with him and um and his grip on his business is not great um but it's there in the second season you know we really kept his family more or less intact and completely just destroyed his work family um and this season is really about all of that wreckage um sort of coming into relief i think for for him and him having to and and marty really having to take stock and begin to actually for the first time in his life have a um be in relationship to his um to his own um chaos you know and, and you know that he has caused um and that's been really you know that that's been really challenging and really fun you know for me um and i think it was great this season too because all of the characters really get to breathe now you know they're well established we understand who we are we know what the business is who if you watch it you know what it is so we're not having to sort of educate ourselves and the audience at the same time about what this you know management consulting is what it looks like what is this animal and now we get to just see you know all of the characters now Clyde and Doug and Jeannie is clearly you see have their own arcs you know irrespective of not completely irrespective but they're they're having their own um, arcs in their own lives that you know sort of weave in and out but it's not just about of, the pod anymore. True, but I was, I was saying to Matthew, they also kind of don't know what to do with Marty. What's really fun to me so far in the season is watching Doug, who needs Marty to seem like he's a decent person. <laughs> and without having that kind of balance, he's really worse than we think he is. Oh, he's bad. Doug yeah. is, you, Doug's fucked up this season. Yeah. Yeah. No, he is. Both of them, Clyde as well. They, Clyde's bad, too. Doug is so small and venal and petty and yeah. horrible. I love and, uh, yeah, it's really fun. It's, great. it's really fun to do because he's this very... I always imagine him, like, when Mar when he's not with Marty, I imagine him, like, uh, uh, C-3PO just, you know, <laughs> tipped up. Powering you know? down. And then, yeah, powering down. And then when Marty's back, he's back up. And, yeah. It's, yeah. But this uh, season's so great, too, because everybody's so, I mean, everybody else is as lonely as Marty is now. I mean, because in this That weird, was our family. That was it. Yeah. Exactly. And, and you know, that was that, even though it was a dysfunctional family, there was definition. When you have a daddy there, the kids have roles to play. And without that, I mean, just, I mean, and there's a, just watching Ben Schwartz this season, who's just underplaying in a way I and just doing some really great acting in those, those scenes with the craziest boss anybody could ever have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's and that's what's great. It's, it's it's everyone really. This season I think was the is the season uh, where all of the characters really get fleshed out, and we really get to see, you know, the underpinning of all these people. You see Clyde's horrible dysfunction as he goes off the rails, and like you said, Doug becomes like this full-on petty warrior. And and Jeannie's just a beast, you know. Jeannie's like they all kind of need Marty just because it's a, it's some weird way. We're Marty's ballast, like, right? yeah. He's kind of like the best and worst of this, and we kind of don't want to be him, but we'll like watch it and sort of we're like basically like pilot fish picking up the chum <laughs> behind the great white shark, or pardon me, the great black shark in this case. Uh, 
But this reminds me of something I asked you guys when you came in to talk, uh, because the show seems liberated by not having that sort of sort of test case of the week that you were going through in that first season. Mm -hmm. And also, it, it, it means there's a lot less sort of like exposition every week. And, we, and this season, we're really seeing just jumping into it fully about character. And that's got to be really great for you, isn't it? Yeah, it's a lot of fun. And I think for everyone on the show, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun because it was the, the table was already set, so to speak, you know, in the first two seasons. We really, we really were able to uh, create, uh, I think, you know, the sort of lay the groundwork for now in this season being able to, to launch and really, you know, find these storylines that I still think are kind of surprising and, and not predictable, but when they happen, you're like, oh, yeah, of course. You know, you feel like, yeah, I guess I could see if I go back that that's where you were headed. And how do these guys get back together now? Do they get back together? Do they get back together? And if they do so, under what circumstances? What's the new construction like? And what are the new deals and allegiances that are being made? And who's valuable and who's, you know, uh, can be jettisoned? It's it's all in there, I think, this season. That scene where you walk past Clyde, you go into your ex-wife's house, and you just don't pay any attention to him? Yeah. That really is like the scene watching, it's like watching a dad walk into his house and not talk to the kid and just... Ben's not knowing how to deal with that. I mean, just and then just sort of acting out after he leaves. I mean, that's a really great scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, and, and there's and there's a ton of that stuff because you know, a lot of secrets this year. Tons of secrets from each other. You know what I mean? That's one thing we didn't really have in the first two seasons. We kind of knew it was us against them in a way, and now it's we're not sure. You know, it's been broken. So it's like who's really on whose team and and what can you do to be kicked off the island? And once you're off the island, how do you get back on the island? You know, or do you want to get back on? The or island? do you want to get back on the island? Do you want to make them think you're back on the island just long enough to fuck them? It's all of that stuff is happening. <laughs> it's like survive. It is like Survivor. What, what I thought was so funny about the second season, I want to ask you about this, Matthew, is that we think these guys are kind of greedy and venal and petty until we see them in Las Vegas, where they seem like regular people. <laughs> <laughs> Compared to these Vegas business types they're dealing with, right? Yeah, I, that was, I mean, it was really a, a natural to put them in Vegas and and uh, in the casino world because it's it uh, it is um, a habitat, you know. It is a, an aquarium of uh, greed and desperation, you know. And so, <laughs> so uh, it was the perfect spot to to drop them, I think. I just say after the humi humiliation with the cops, now one of my favorite scenes is when you're up with Mather, and he like blasts with a shotgun, and you're covered in watermelons. Isn't that great? <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, it's just it's the it's the humiliation that he finally needs to yeah, sort of, like pull him of out course. of that. But it's just, I mean, I thought it was like a really like incredibly funny thing to write. But I just, I actually rewound it to watch it. It's kind of, Wait a second, did he just get splattered with watermelon? Yeah. No, he got splattered. Yeah, oh watermelon. Oh my God, it's watermelon. Watermelon all over your After face. After a beatdown by the LAPD, he's blasted <laughs> with a shotgun. Now take some watermelon in take your watermelon face. Take watermelon in your face. Yeah. I do a whole minstrel show that this season. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to like it. <laughs> or maybe they or will. Maybe we don't will. know. <laughs> But I mean, you talk. I mean, that's a big kind of incredibly funny, painful farce moment. And I just thought that was one of the smart. I talked about this with you guys when I met you. That what's so great about the show is it's a show that deals with race, but it's not about race. That's just an incidental thing. And I just have that moment yeah, with watermelon and not comment on it. Yeah, it's those perfect things to me. Those elliptical, you know, coming at it from this side. That that again. It's how it really would happen. You know, it's how it happens out there. No one, usually no one walks up to you, has the temerity to walk up to you and go, hey, you black people. You know, that's not happening. They're finding other ways to, to put the needle in you, you know? And that's what I think is really interesting and it feels real. Like that Marty has to deal with the things that he's imagining, but that are also known, that he can count on, that they can talk about internally, how we're gonna play this guy because he's like that and he's thinking like that. And okay, you take him because he doesn't want to hear from me, or no, I'll take it because he doesn't want to hear from you. You know, that sort of thing. And, and not giving a shit about it. It's like, he, I don't care what he thinks about me, I want his money. You know, that having to keep, you know, hurdling over those things, like what does that do to you, to your soul after a while? Those are, those are hits, you know? And after a while, either you really armor up 
and just push through it and then wait for it to crack way down the line or you just let it crack right there? Don't don't pitch Iron Man, Iron Man here. <laughs> you know? You get enough fucking publicity on Iron Man. So, you know, it's subtle, but... You're such a hater, man. You're such a hater. Yeah, armor so up. you guys alone for a while to work yeah. this out, because yeah. I, can't, I can't deal with this kind of anger on the stage. But I just thought, for me, that's, that was the answer to the question I asked you guys you came in, because it's, first of all, and I mentioned this to you when we, when we met, that's a show about three generations of black men, I think is still an extraordinary thing on television, just to see something like that. And to see these, these guys trying to, you know, fathers and sons, trying to make contact with each other in some way, and the one who's the most immature is the one who's kind of running the household. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. that's fun too. And he's getting schooled constantly this year by his by his dad and his son. But his dad, you know, this year we, you know, Glenn has a nice character arc where he gets to be a little adolescent, and yeah. finally he gets to be the one that I'm lecturing, going, "Hey, come here. What are you doing?" You know. So that's that's kind of nice for Glenn to not have to always be the voice of wisdom on the show. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's it's. Honestly, the most exciting thing about the show for, for me is to get to write this, uh, to get to write three generations of, 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 of black men. I mean, it's just not, you know, and as a black man. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> oh my God, you are. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. I didn't. Thank you. I didn't. No, yeah. but it, it, it is, um, it is really exciting to me and I, and I keep, I keep, you know, I think I talked to you when we first talked about the show. I said, you know, there's not even the old like WB urban comedy night anymore. It's there's just nothing out there. And so to be able to to uh, write something for for Don and Glenn and 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 Donis is is really crump. You know? Go ahead and crump for him. Are you do, you, do you, no, don't do it. Don't crump. Don't crump. Don't crump. <laughs> my other crump. <laughs> you have to go. It's no. Part of my part of my crumping. You fan twerk club. and you're very crump. small. <laughs> but you must get people who talk to you about this, Don. That, that seeing that relationship in that household, you must get fans who are thrilled about that. You know, it's it's. I, I was when we shot in Vegas. I was coming downstairs one time, and we were shooting. You know, we had to shoot at really off peak hours because you know we were in a casino, which was great. That MGM gave us you know the ability to be on their floors, but their casinos. So. We would start very early, and it's about 4.30 in the morning. I came downstairs, and there's a woman, you know, waxing on the hallways. And she came, and she's like, hey, can I talk to you for a second? I said, yeah. She goes, you're on that movie. That, that You're on that movie on TV, right? So I was trying to figure out what she meant. She goes, you got that, you got that son who's gay on that, that TV show in that movie. Or that. I said, oh, yeah, she's talking about House of Lies. I said, yeah. She goes, what are you going to do about that? <laughs> and I said, I said, what do you mean? She's like, well, what do you do? What are you going to do? I mean, he's gay, right? I mean, what do you do? And I said, well, I, I don't think Marty, I don't think the character knows what to do, but I think what he tries to do is just love his son. He just loves his son. I think that you just, that's your son. You just love him. She goes, yeah, yeah, you just love him. She goes, because my daughter's gay, and, you know, people give her a lot of shit, and she's always, you know, in situations, and my family's not always so cool with it, but I just love her, and I think, you know, you just gotta love your kids, and I was like, yeah, you just love your kids. She's like, all right, bet. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, love, so. What are you gonna do about that? Yeah, That's just the I, she took me the total different way. I was like, where are we going with this? <laughs> but, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, you know, there, there's nothing to do. It reminds me of that, you know, that Saturday Night Live commercial where, you know, they show, I don't know if you guys remember, it's like, it's a scene and it's like the, one of those um, medical, uh, one of those prescription commercials where, you know, it just looks like it's a commercial for depression, you know, Will Ferrell's looking out of the window and he's sad and they show all these dads looking out the window and they show what they're looking at and their son's out there in a tutu and <laughs> playing with dolls and, you know. And the prescription was, the, the medicine was called Gayasin. He said, because it's your problem, not his. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, it's like, you know, that's, I, but I think we honestly deal with it. I think we, it's great to have Marty n not have any answers. And the only thing he knows is that he loves the shit out of Roscoe. That's, that's all he knows. He's like, I don't know how to, what to tell you to do. It's going to be hard out there. Um... I don't like that purse with that eyeliner, but you know, you do whatever. 
No, it's, it's, it's interesting because the show is really so much, and you just said it, I want to ask you a little bit about this, Matthew, as a kind of a closing question. It's so much about fear and, and how you deal with fear because it's so much about modern masculinity, you know, and the idea of how a modern black man comports himself in the business world if he's got a white wife and a biracial son who happens to be fiddling with gender identity. I mean, that could be like a really scary Oprah episode, but you guys are playing it for comedy. And I just wonder how all blending all these things, because none of this stuff's in that book. <laughs> no, yeah, that's not in that book. Yeah, I, I, I mean, the question is about fear, yeah, but in, in fear as in the, in this comedy. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, it's just it's um, I can draw, you know, I I live in fear every day, you know, um, and I can either cave in and submit to it or make something out of it um and uh you know it just it, this character absolutely is 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 uh you know is the most fearful character i've ever written and is the most in a way reflective of a of kind of getting to write you know my id and uh and you release that fear, you know, into the world and into and into uh, something. Hopefully, that 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 you know exalts and consoles or whatever, you know, that that like that that provides uh, um, some comedy, you know. So let me ask you, Don, as a last question, because I've I've often wondered about Marty. Is he somebody who hates what he does but realizes he's really good at it, or does he just have contempt? For the people that he works with, or that he, that his, his client base, because it really it seems to be like a really fine line, and it wavers from episode to episode. I think he thinks that it's a zero sum game, and it's just I win at all costs, and fuck it, that's how it is. And then we have these sort of Greek things that happen to him as a result. You know what I mean? He makes the the deal with U.S. National, and then when it comes to the point where he's under the bridge and the cop says, put your hands behind your back, he's like, fuck you, bring it, you know? So I think he thinks that he's got it all under control and that he is immune to it, but it's there's always these watershed moments where he, he's, he realizes that he's not, and he's completely undone and and just bandied around by it, you know what I mean? So I think that's what makes him rush back to the job and rush back to the viciousness of that because it's known, it's usually quantifiable, there's numbers around it, there's a bottom line, it makes sense, you know? I add this to that and I subtract that and then I amortize this and then that's what that number is and that makes sense. When I come home and my dad wants to talk about mom killed herself and you're dealing with, you know, you're projecting feelings from your inability to deal with them. I'm like, shut up! You know, you can't take any of that. So, I, what was your question? <laughs> it's Gayerson, does because it's, it's your, your problem. problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it really is my problem now, I'm sorry. I, does he, is he somebody who's good at something he hates? I don't know if he, I don't, I, I've never as the character examined it to that degree. I think he's, tells himself that he likes it. I don't, I don't think he hates it. I mean, that's my, I, I don't think he hates what he does. I think he hates parts of himself in what he does. Um, it's what he has to pull, call on to to do it okay. sometimes. Yeah, my but I think he'll do it. My He's, brother is a management consultant for many, many, many years, and uh, you know, he, the thing about that world is, you know, for, certainly for some of some of these guys, not for all of them, but I think for this character, there's nothing more comforting than a statistical model because it. You know, it it it's like a, you know, those things for your dog, the thunder jacket, you know, that yeah. comforts them, and you know, he wraps them around. I think he, I think Marty wraps 
numbers and statistics and regression models around himself like a thunder jacket and and it you know it soothes him you know so i think he loves that part of the job well let's thank two of the guys who work on the one of the smartest shows on television the man whose helmet just gets it there matthew conahan and don Cheadle. And let me thank showtime too thank you guys so much thank you everybody. thank you guys